Hello and welcome to 400 Years, a new series which will explore the fascinating relationship between India and Britain. And it will delve into some of the key facts behind this relationship, but also lift the lid off of some previously hidden secrets. The East India Company is, of course, the starting point of the tremendous tale about the relationship between Britain and India. But that tale involves many others. In 1588, British merchants asked for permission to explore the India seas for trading purposes. In 1600, they were granted permission to set up a company, the East India Company. Fast forward to the third voyage into the India seas, which saw William Hawkins land in Surat and be the first member of the East Indian Company to set foot on Indian soil. The Dutch East India Company was already trading and had control of the spice trade coming out of the East Indies. Portugal was also in India. In fact, they had already been there for over a hundred years and had colonised parts of the country. Add to all of this, the Mughal Empire were the ones that had most of control and power over India. So the small East India Company didn't really have the best of starts. So the East India Company was set up in 1600 under a royal charter to engage in trade with the East and it had a monopoly on that trade with the East. It was not the British who conquered India, it was a a rogue multinational corporation. A company which had its office in one small street in London, in a building five windows wide, with a permanent staff, 100 years after it was founded, of only 35 people. That company defeated the most economically rich and uh, productive corner of the richest empire in the world then. The Mughal Empire at the time of uh, Plassey was phenomenally economically powerful. It's not just a pri body of private traders. The fact that it's a company, and it's a company at a time when there aren't many companies, unlike today, um, means that it has the sanction of the Queen and the, and the British mon you know, monarchy. It is a separate institution. It's somewhere, it's not, um, it isn't the British state, it's not the, not the British military, etc. Um, it has its own kind of interests. The first voyages of the East India Company were not, of course, to India proper. It was to the East Indies. It was the, the, the East India Company was to trade with the East Indies, which meant initially the Spice Islands, what we today would call Indonesia. The journey would take several months. These were sailing ships. This was the, the great age of sail. So when the British first come to India, they want to trade in spices. That's the big trade of the, of, of the early 1600s. They go to basically to Kerala, and there they buy the local pepper, but also nutmeg that is traded into India from further east, from Indonesia. The massive profits that uh, accrue in the early voyages begin to diminish as other traders from other countries are, are also flooding the markets in, in Europe with these high value items. The Dutch uh, were uh, in a much stronger position. Uh, they had a, a more modernised stock market that allowed for the uh, gathering of greater capital, so their ships were bigger, uh, better stocked, their weaponry was more advanced. In the early uh, 17th century, the Mughal Empire was at its peak. Uh, Aurangzeb had an income greater than all the crowned heads of Europe put together. When uh, there's early attempts in the, in the 17th century for the East India Company to take on the Mughals, they lose. While it's true that the British never set out to conquer India and they never went east with a plan of, uh, of imperialism, from the beginning they have the right to wage war. And this, of course, is a violent age. There are pirates on the sea, there are other European nations that want to sink them. There are a million reasons why you, know, you would prefer to go to sea with cannon than without. Where it was new, I think, is that it was a corporation. It was a business run for the benefit of its shareholders. The East India Company realises after some time that wool and iron are not of that great interest in Java and Sumatra, so it starts to move into the Indian subcontinent in order to buy textiles, cotton and calico for example, to trade with Southeast Asia. It sets up its first trading post in India in 1615. Although the British in a sense got India as a consolation prize having lost what they got out for, which was the, 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 the nutmeg of, of, of Indonesia. 
um, they soon compensated by realizing the enormous potential in trading in textiles from eastern India. The capital for running the company, for buying the silks and the bolts that they would sell uh, in, in London and in Portsmouth and, and in the European capitals, came from land revenue on land they'd seized and conquered. What a complicated situation, one that started over the battle for the supremacy of shipping routes and trade. At the heart of that was a company, a company like no other, one that was set up to trade, but also had powers to take land, to wage war, and also resolve a peace. So how did what started with trade turn into colonialism and empire? That we will discover in the next episode of 400 Years. Thank you.